All right, Jason Roush is going to talk to, to us about packet or APRS plan that Fox just really got put yeah, up. Yeah, apparently uh, when it squeezed it down. Yeah, yeah. ESP32 packet and APRS. Take it away. Okay. Okay, uh, so I find that these three tend to cover. So good morning, good morning, and Dobryuta. <laughs> it's just a little joke of mine. I can see no one's laughing, so apparently it's my joke. All right, and Jason, I'm sorry, I'll try not to walk around. It's my habit, so I don't uh, get too stabbing. So. Okay, so um, I'll give you a quick little background on me and uh, Remy Bilodo, who's uh, actually watching live right now from Quebec, so uh, I have to make sure I watch what I say about him. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I live in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia, and um, I've been licensed 28 years. My, my, my main focus in the hobby has been APRS, uh, DMR, P25, and I do get into a little bit of QR, PHF, which is um, when I go camping, basically. Um, by day, I'm a uh, Motorola systems manager, so that's why I actually work for Motorola, and uh, I used to be a field tech. And uh, at the beginning of the year, I switched over, and now I'm a uh, desk jockey. I became the enemy. I'm a, I'm a manager now, so. Um, and I, I say I'm the owner, engineer, and janitor at RPC Electronics. So that's my quick little uh, plug for myself. Uh, Remy, he lives up in Quebec, and I think it's Presaic. I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Remy, I'm sorry, I know you're listening. Uh, he's been licensed 32 years. He uh, does a lot of APRS. He's really big into Allura, which is something he's been trying to convince me to play with, which I'm definitely interested in. And he does a lot of solar powered weather stations and that sort of thing, too. So he's electronics tech for the U of University of Quebec. Uh, Abidi? Ab Abidi to be. Oh, man, he's going to kill me. Um, no, actually, he's one of the nicest guys I know, so he probably. Uh, and then he, I call him the embedded programming master because he is the man that has made all this stuff work. The guy is um, just unbelievable. I, I can tell you in the past I can remember sending him a fairly complex idea and instead of getting back, well, let me see what I can do, 30 minutes later I get back the code, here, try this, did it work? The guy's unbelievable. He really is. And it always worked. There might have been a little bug or whatever, but it worked. Okay, so a little quick history on this. So Remy and I, we've uh, kind of been uh, partnered friends uh, for, geez, I don't know, 10, 10 years maybe now? These are actually two products that he and I did together. Uh, the YAG Tracker, which was a uh, graphical APRS display with a built-in um, modem. Um, this was, that was pretty much it. It was, you know, a graphical display with a modem. It had pretty nice UI. Um, it wasn't touchscreen. It had a uh, mechanical encoder. And uh, this thing was pretty cool. I, I ran one as my primary uh, unit in my vehicle for years and um, until I decided to kind of shelve it because the main processor is no longer made and I always feared that one day it would die and it's like I wanted to archive it. So, And then the other product we came out with was the Express Tracker, which was essentially a non-display version, if you want to look at it that way. It had a USB interface and we had some additional things that we had added to it. And it was essentially in direct competition with the Tiny Track and the Open Tracker. So think of it as our version of the Open Tracker and the Tiny Track. So anyways, just wanted to show you that um, we've been working on this stuff for a long time, you know, various APRS related products. Uh, so let's dive right into uh, some design goals. Um, so here were some things that we said, here's some stuff we would like this to do, whatever this device ends up being. Uh, so we got uh, integrated 12 carbon AX25 modem. Uh, we wanted it to be USB. FTDI preferred just simply because FTDI driver support is pretty much built in to just about every modern OS now. I know Linux, Windows 10, 11, you know, and so forth. Uh, we wanted KISS through USB and Bluetooth, and uh, we'll talk a little more about the Bluetooth aspect of things. Uh, definitely want an integrated GPS receiver. Why hang more stuff off this thing? We don't have to do it. Um, we want to avoid going with a specific modem IC, like an MX614, something like that. We wanted to do everything through the DAC and the ADC pins. And uh, we uh, definitely want to go with something like an op-amp design, which is pretty cheap. 
Um, we wanted this to operate as an autonomous tracker, but also we want to be able to tether a smart device to it if you want to do more with it. But we want to be able to take that smart device away and have it just kind of take back over as an autonomous device. Small, lightweight, and low cost to produce. And um, small, lightweight, um, that was more of a, uh, we've had some people say they'd like to, you know, maybe potentially fly this on a balloon, you know, that sort of thing. So that's kind of where we were. But, but really, um, low cost is really kind of where this whole thing is based because when it comes to APRs trackers, you know, it, it's, it's kind of at the point now where um, no one wants to spend a ton of money to just have their vehicle showing up on the map. So you kind of have to make it an attractive thing by saying, hey, look, it's not going to cost you too much. Um, I, I added this minimal LED indication. Now, later in the uh, presentation, you might you might think that I did that broke this rule. The debate is uh, it's up for debate. Um, easy audio adjustment. A lot of the uh, devices that are on the market. You either have to go through the web, you know, web interface or something to actually adjust your audio levels. That's nice and all, uh, but I like being able to just put a small flathead screwdriver on a pot and be able to adjust it really quick. So that was something. And then lastly, a web interface configuration. Um, mechanism to be able to configure uh, all your settings. All right, so um, a lot of choices when it comes to microprocessor. You've got your picks, your arms, your cortex, and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm a pick guy previously. Now, I'm not a programmer. I'm not very good. I've delved into the pick and playing with that. And so it's really fell on what was Remy really comfortable with. And he's he wrote all the code for those other two devices with ARM and Cortex devices, so I knew he was comfortable with that. What I didn't know at the time when we first started talking about this was he had already started diving into the ESP32. I was starting to dive into that a little bit just out of curiosity. You know, I didn't think I could necessarily do anything great with it myself, but I knew with the help of somebody else could do something great with it. So I think it's uh, safe to say we chose the ESP32. Um, here's some uh, specs here. I'll just go down these really quick. Uh, it's a 32-bit microprocessor. It is two CPU cores. It can run from 80 to 240 megahertz. Um, has three hardware UARTs. 12-bit uh, ADC. You can have up to eight channels of ADC on that. Of course, as you use more channels, of course, you lose more of the GPIO. Uh, two-bit uh, DAC channel. Two, two eight-bit DAC channels. Uh, I squared C SPI has an SD card interface and PWM. Uh, 22 pins of uh, general purpose I.O., so you know, we hang a lot of stuff off this thing. Uh, 32 megs of onboard SPI flash, so we don't have to add anything, which we had to do with the YAG tracker. Uh, we had to have an actual separate um, flash to go with that. Uh, I'm sorry, not, not flash, it was a, uh, an EEPROM. We want built-in Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. We already talked about that. Uh, the Wi-Fi that's building this is good for, it's only 2.4 gigs, not 5 gig, but it's uh, BG and N. Um, oh, I should mention Bluetooth Low Energy. Now, here's something that uh, I'm not an Apple user. Um, I guess the, the word is, is that iPhone devices have to have Bluetooth Low Energy. Is that, is that correct? Can anyone kind of confirm that for me? No? Okay. Because uh, we've been told that uh, iPhone devices typically will not talk to an ESP32 on the standard Bluetooth protocol, but it will on low, low, uh, low energy. So that's something I want to get confirmed because uh, as you can imagine, if you cut out all the iPhone users, it cuts out a lot of your, your user base. So, so that's something I want to you know, kind of get to the bottom of. Uh, it's 3.3 volt operating voltage, and uh, it can be programmed through the Arduino IDE, but we'll talk about that later on too. There's definitely some, um, some things that have to do with that. Okay, um, so early on, this is what we did to just kind of test, uh, you know, our functionality, you know, that we have something that could potentially work. So what we did was we, we grabbed a couple of these, uh, it's the Do It uh, Dev Kit modules, it's uh, on the left there, you can see it plugged in. And then all I did was I basically just designed a very uh, simple um, PCB that's essentially just our audio modem section, uh, didn't worry about any, any of the other uh, and the other functions, we just want to you know, get the audio mode and part of this working. Uh, I did include the TTL uh, UR interface so we could plug a GPS into this thing uh, as we were doing some of our testing. Um, so yeah, that's where we started. Um, the, uh, right off the bat, we learned that the D 
decode was pretty good, and we hadn't really even tweaked anything yet. Um, we, I was, that was the part I was the most worried about, because I've seen with other devices that were trying to do all the software decoding without a modem IC like an MH614, sometimes the decoding was a little bit dicey, but not with this thing. And remember, that was, this was just a, you know, a mock-up. So you can see that uh, the module, whoops, wrong button. It was got the module there, and you can see it ended up soldering a whole bunch of wires on this thing. It was you know kind of hacked up, and um, we kind of we kind of started aiming big. You know, uh, we we got one of these touchscreen LCDs, start getting everything all um, wired up, and this was this is kind of where we started. So that leads me to it's time to take a step back. We're probably getting a little ahead of ourselves. Um, we don't even really have hardware yet and we're getting all crazy with LCDs and everything. Which feature creep can kill a project? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just a question. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. microphone. Sure. Uh, so what was the LCD module that you're going to face with the USB? Type? Okay, the question was uh, what was the LCD module? That module is um, Give me a second. I'm trying to remember who we bought this from because we ended up going through a couple of different vendors. You know, can I get back to you on that? Because I, I don't remember the exact module. This was a, it was a five inch a TFT with a capacitive touch. And that was the other thing too. This module was like a hundred bucks. And uh, when you're talking about hundred bucks for an LC, you're not exactly talking about low cost. So, so again, this was another like, whoa, cool. Uh oh, actually hang on a second here. We're kind of getting outside of our design goals here really quick. So anyways, this is still slated for something down the road. We definitely want to do something like this. And the LCDs are getting better and cheaper and everything. So um, this isn't a dead idea. But I just wanted to, I did want to show this because this was kind of our path of, you know, where we were going. Okay, so, so we're going to take a step back. And um, so with said, let's hold off on that display. That's... You know, we're getting a little crazy. Let's solidify the packet generation decoding. Decoding was working pretty well. We're going to talk about the, the packet transmitting side of things. Um, we need to decide on a form factor. Like, you know, okay, that LCD was going to obviously kind of say, hey, this thing's got to be this big. You know, that's way bigger than what we originally talked about. Um, let's take this thing into a you know cohesive physical design. Let's kind of decide. And then let's stop hacking all this and start designing. And by that, I mean, I'm not real big on bodging wires like that, soldering to the back of a board stuff. I, with the cost of PCBs today being so cheap, I'm real big on, let's go ahead and get a board designed. And it's only gonna cost us maybe 50 bucks to get you know half a dozen boards. Let's just do that. If we got bugs, if we got problems, we'll fix it. It's not, it's not like the days, when I first started doing this stuff 20 years ago, 22 years ago, when I was, literally in my bedroom in high school, there was there was no, let's just get a couple of test PCBs because it was going to cost me 500 bucks. You know, that wasn't going to happen. I was a high school student. Today, with Osage Park, um, JLC PCB, some of these others, I mean, you can get four or five test boards for well under $100. So, so that's kind of what I mean by that. You know, let's just go ahead and, let's go ahead and dive in. A little self-explanatory, right? So yeah, so we got to that point and then this happened. Okay, so we said, okay, well, huh, what do we do now? Every day I go in Mauser and I have my BOM and I go through and I go, oh, that part's not available now. Okay. Next week, oh, those two parts aren't available now. Great. What are we doing here? You know? So I mean the thing was on hold for quite a while, so we just kind of stopped. We were deep, we were working with the parts we had on hand, which wasn't much, and you sure as uh, heck wasn't going to start adding new parts in that you couldn't get, you know. So, all right, so we got past all that, we got past that. So let's start diving into some of the more technical aspects of this. So, so here's your ESP32, um, and this is basically your minimal connections. Uh, let's let's just ignore this stuff for now because obviously these are not the minimal connections. These are, but. When it comes down to the ESP32, you basically you need a uh, you need to tie the uh, the enable line high. You need to have some good filtering. Okay, so one of the things we found with the ESP32 is it is a little bit finicky with voltage fluctuation. So you want to filter it pretty well. So 
Here we've got a 0.1 and 0.1 microfarad and a 22 picofarad cap on the um, on the main supply pin. That did that's done wonders for just you know just getting all your transient voltage noise out. But also on the power supply side, we've got a 3.3 uh, volt uh, LDO regulator coming right off the USB port. We've got a 10 microfarad cap on the input side, and we've got a 100 microfarad cap on the output side, and that seems to have really choked off any issues power-wise. Uh, that's done a pretty good job, actually. Um, the only other thing is this uh, ESP32 underscore IO0 pin. That's very important because we need that to put this thing into a bootload mode. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, this resistor sometimes is needed and sometimes isn't needed. I know that's about as clear as mud. Um, we included it because it doesn't appear to hurt if it's there that, and it acts as a, as a, as a pull-up. Uh, but in some documentation tells you you don't need it, some, some says it does, we went ahead and added it. And it doesn't appear to hurt anything to have it there. So um, that's, that's, your, you know, that's, that's your basic connections just to get this thing powered up. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the flashing. So the, uh, the SP32 is really nice the way, um, the way it works as far as uh, flashing it and resetting it. You can do all this through, through, the, um, through those pins. But there is a little bit, I call it the dance, the pulsing dance, it, the way that the pins have to be pulsed in time to get the same in the bootload mode. Um, what we found was, so this is kind of a traditional reset circuit that a lot of people will spell out. I think even the ESP32 documentation spells this out. This works most of the time, but it can be a little bit finicky. It doesn't always work. What we did find is we found this this IC right here, which is essentially this in a single package, this thing is rock solid. We never have had a problem with it. So we ended up going away from the discrete component and going to this. Now, what's really happening here is that by pulsing the DTR and RTS lines, you're getting, uh, so you know, like when, when this one, when this goes high, this is tying this through, but it's also tying back through to here and it back feeds through here. And by doing that, it's pulsing the pins correctly. Now, in order to get these signals, you can either have a, a true RS-232 serial port, which who here still has a computer? Well, let's say a laptop. Laptop that's going to RS-232. I know most of us have a desktop you now. So obviously the FTDI was the way we wanted to go. And the FTDI is one of the few uh, commercial <coughs> options out there that has DTR, RTS, you know, these lines to be able to do this function. So, we originally started with the uh, FT232, which is kind of the more popular version. However, that thing is virtually impossible to get your hands on right now. It's still part of that part shortage. And it's about eight or nine dollar part. Well, FTDI came out with the FT231X. This thing's only like a buck fifty, or two dollars and ten cents, something like that. Way cheaper. And it does all the same functionality, and you can buy these right now. I can go on Mauser right now and actually go buy one of these. So we decided to move to that. So have the functionality that we needed. Um, so this this is your basic, uh, your, you know, as far as the interfacing to this IC, you know, your USB connector. Um, there's, we're still doing some power filtering here as well. Just going in, just power filtering before you're getting to the regulator, to the LDO regulator, uh, and then our RTS DTR line, and of course our transmit receive lines. So that's. Um, that's generally uh, that's generally been a very solid circuit. Once once we develop once we came up with this and uh, kind of eliminated a few problematic things, this has been very solid. And I'm here to tell you, I spent a good probably two weeks troubleshooting why I couldn't get the SP32 to go into bootload mode. Sometimes it would, sometimes it would. It was extremely frustrating, and I thought to myself, well, if this becomes a product and we start shipping these. No one's going to put up with that, <laughs> you know. So I was like, we've got to get this thing working perfectly every time. So I just threw this up here. This is the uh, this is that uh, the pulse table or truth table for those pins. So, so you know, you can see you know, DTR and RTS is high, and that gives you a high on the enable and the IO zero line and so forth. So, uh, if you're interested in truth tables, if that's like your thing, there you go. I did that just for you. Okay, and uh, real quick, this is just a. Uh, um, uh, just showing where those, and now I don't have a, you know, a timeline here to show you the actual time, but basically what really is happening is VCC's got to go high first, 
then the RTS line has to go and stay high, and then the DTR line has to pulse, but they all have, they can't all come up at the same time. They all have to do it in succession. Okay, so let's dive into the audio of the op-amp. So it's a dual op-amp setup. We've got uh, the transmit path and our receive path here, okay? Now, pay attention real quick to this right here, okay? That's gonna be important later on slides just remember that because a lot of people look at that and they go well, why are these tied together I had to ask that question I said hey Remy well, why are these tied together he goes let me explain actually he's really good about hand drawing stuff and then he'll take a picture of it and send it to me and I'm looking at it going oh okay so and in fact I took that hand drawing and I and I and I uh, tried to make it uh, nice and pretty for a slide so we'll, we'll get to that but anyways the um Transmit side of things, uh, basically going through the op amp, and then we've got a low pass filter here that is uh, filtering, and then we've got a, uh, a 10K trim pie here to control our level, and then of course we're going through a uh, 0.1 microfarad cap. Now, I'll just go and caveat this by telling you right now that we're having some transmit audio problems. Now, I've got some scope shots I'll show you here in a couple slides, and we're not exactly sure what's wrong. Now, here's the really frustrating part. Remy's got a hand-built perf board version of this that works perfectly. He didn't have a single problem with it. I've got a beautiful surface mount LC, or, um, PCB, and I have all kinds of problems. <laughs> One working theory is that with all the jumper wires and everything, maybe the impedance, I, it's really hard to say. So I'll just go ahead and say now, if anyone's got any ideas, I'm open. I'm open to any ideas because I'm running out of ideas on what could possibly be wrong. Now, uh, so we'll just, we'll, we'll table that for a second, okay? Uh, so on the receive side, very simple. We're just running it through the op amp, and then this is a feedback. This trimmer acts as a feedback to, um, to act as a feedback for that, that op amp section. <coughs> One thing we found was is that 180K resistor was just way too high. So we replaced it with a 27 because I was looking at this thing and my audio level was so low and I said, there's something wrong here. And Remy goes, you know what? And he goes, that, that might be a little high. Let's, let's try. So we, we threw a 27K in there. Audio went way up. If you've ever worked with commercial radios, Motorola, you know, any, any commercial, they want a lot of audio, a lot of audio. So I was testing with a Motorola CDM 1250 and I could barely get any transmit audio passing through. And that was with the emphasis and the emphasis turned off and all that stuff. So swapping out that resistor made a big, big difference. Okay, so I got a couple of little flow charts here just so for those of you who are uh, really into this. Um, this. This is the kind of stuff that uh, Remy hand drew out and sent to me. He goes, oh, here's, here's generally how it works. Because again, I'm a hardware guy, I'm not really a software guy, so. Um, but basically he's, uh, you know, he's, he's generating the tones uh, out of the, uh, the DAC uh, he's going through a, an I2S bus at 50 kilohertz sampling. Uh, well, the tones are regenerated, then it's going through the uh, DAC, and then the audio is coming out. And then, of course, that's being passed through that low pass filter that I showed you in that schematic. And, of course, that's going through a 10K ohm trim pod to control the level. Okay, here's, um, here's where I, I really kind of get off the bus. Uh, and I'm just gonna be honest with you. So if you have any questions about this stuff, I will be more than happy to write those questions down and go to Remy and maybe get some more meaningful answers for you. But the de decoding, the way, uh, the way that he explained it to me anyways, um, is basically he's taking that post fan pass filter audio, he's running it through these, these mixing sections essentially, he's of course doing all this in software. Uh, and he's running against a sine wave at 1200, cosine 1200, sine 2200, and cosine 2200. And then he's comparing it down, and then he gets a bit at the end, is it one or a zero? And then the quarter layer two, he's uh, doing a much more simplified version, but these are the two quarter layers he's using to run all this audio through. And again, I don't, I'm not gonna stand up here and pretend to understand exactly what he's doing here, okay? Those quarter layers are part of this now, so you got that AFK, AFSK audio coming in, it's going to the, uh, whoops, keep hitting the wrong button, sorry about that. Um, going through the ABC, going through this uh, I2S bus, and then he's running it through some bandpass filters, and then he's running that through those two correlators. 
So he's doing this for the 1200, oh, I'm sorry, 1200 and 2200 hertz, running through those four layers. And essentially what he gets at the end is he has four different decoders. And what we found is when we run the audio through all four of these decoders, most of them decode every packet. Um, decoder three and four tend to be the ones that are a little bit more picky. But I did a test uh, about two weeks ago. I just set this thing up in my shop and I just let it run on the air with a, with a radio. I came back a couple of days later. I had right at about 4,800 packets that had passed through this thing and it, decoder one missed one. It missed one packet. Decoder two, I think, missed three. And then they started to dive off. And decoder three lost like 500 packets. And decoder four lost like 800 packets. But that's pretty good. I mean, for, 12, for a 1200 baud channel, we all know how finicky 1200 baud over an FM channel can be. So I thought that was pretty good, especially for decoder one and two to only miss one or miss three. Okay, so remember we talked about that line that was going from one from one opium to the other that's where that that's where this comes in so what remy was explained to me was when it comes to the adc range is that if the audio drops below that zero level then it, it it's the, the equivalent of um uh i don't know i don't know what the best way to to, to describe it it's um it's basically it's out of the range it's out of range you can't deal with it so by having that uh, having that that wire going for or that path from from uh, one e from the one op amp to the other, it allows you it allows us to basically auto adjust. Okay, so the example we have down here, so the example here was okay, it's out of the range. By that auto adjust, we're just using an example of 100 millivolts here, and um, uh, but what it did is it essentially pushes it pushes the audio up within the ADC range to zero to 496 and it allows him to be able to decode the packet or at least to decode that particular part of the packet and that's where that's where that tying those two op amps together is very important and i i believe uh based on what he was explaining to me that's a reason why we are getting such a good decode rate whereas other tncs probably or other modes i should say it's just going to toss that out because it's outside of the range it's like i can't deal with it and it just tosses it so that's why that was so important, and I and that's why we're being such a decode, a good decode rate. All right, so we, we did have a, an interesting bug that um, Remy was using an older oscilloscope, and he didn't see it. But when I ran it through my storage scope, we saw this. So well, that's kind of interesting. That doesn't look right, and realized we had some bits that were swapping. As you can tell, you can see how the audio is actually going up, let's drop it down, going up, and it's consistent, you know, and then of course it reverses. So this is just an example of how a very simple bit shift can cause something like this. And, and Remy didn't see it because his older scope was rounding all this off. He was like, I, I, I never would have seen that, and I just happened to run through there. So I just threw that in just to show you these are the kinds of little things that, you know, will creep up that you might thought everything was fine. The interesting thing is, he was transmitting his audio through his handmade board using this, and it was decoding. It was getting decoded. So, but my stuff, it was like, nah, yeah. this is uh, this is the raw audio. So, so this first this first trace here, it, that's the audio straight out of the pin of the ESP32 before it hits anything. Okay, this is going. This is coming out of the amp just before the low pass filter, and this is just after the low pass filter, okay? So this is no radio involved here. This is just straight audio going through the path. This is uh, 1200 Hertz AFSK test waveform over the air, okay? So this is sending a 1200 Hertz tone over the air, and this I am uh, looking at the 9600 baud basically the discriminator pin of a receiver going straight into my scope. So you can see it's a fairly it's fairly clean. We do have a little bit of this here. And that could potentially have something to do with why I'm not why it's not being decoded. It's, the jury's still out, we're still working on it. This is uh, this is the 22 hertz version of that. So I kind of threw these in just to show that's that's how clean it is going into the radio. Okay. 
and this is what it looks like. Now this is with pre-emphasis and de-emphasis technically on, and the reason I say that is I can turn that off in those more roller radios I was testing with, but most of your amateur grade gear out there, you can't. You can't turn off the pre-emphasis and de-emphasis, so we decided to go ahead and start testing strictly with those radios instead of the commercial, because I want the, I want real world um, results here. You know, is this going to work? If I give you this and you plug it into your IC two AT, you know, handheld from what twenty three years ago, twenty four years ago, um, is it going to work? You know, so that that's really what it comes down to is. Uh, can I hand this to you and can you plug? Because, you know, we're always telling you, hey, if you want to get an APRS, you got an extra two meter radio hanging around, you know, a handheld, mobile, whatever, it's 20 years old, you know. Now you got to use for it, you know. So that's that's kind of, you know, the, the purpose here. It's probably 40 years old. Is it really that? Jeez. Okay, okay. Still there, still yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that was the one with the thumb wheels, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. No, I, was, I wasn't even close. <laughs> Samsonite. Um, anyone get that joke? No? Right. Yeah. I was way off. My wife will get that. She'll watch this later and she'll laugh. And then she'll call me a dork. Uh, so this is the GPS we decided with and to go with. And, and this is actually, this is the most expensive part. Okay? Um, but I think it's worth it. But I'll give you a quick little anecdotal story. When I was, uh, 1415, I went to a ham fest and I paid $120 for a used Garmin GPS 38. Used. Just so I could have a GPS. I paid $120 used. This is 16 bucks in single quantity. I think that's pretty good. You know? And of course you start buying them more than single quantity, price does go down. So anyways, it's a 22 channel GNSS receiver. They don't really call them GPS anymore. They Gone to the global navigation satellite system. Uh, it's tiny. It's only nine millimeters by nine millimeters, so it's a tiny little package. So we can squeeze it in there. Three point three volt. That's always nice to keep everything the same. This thing tracking is only drawing twenty eight mi uh, milliamps when tracking. I think uh, I, I meant to put it up there and I left it out. I think when it's trying to first get lock, I think it goes up like thirty six milliamps. So geez, you know, this power budget's killing us. You know. Um, Excellent out band rejection. That's the other thing about this. Uh, you know, I look at spec sheets for some other similar GPS receivers, and they don't give you any information about out band rejection, but uh, this, this particular company, they give you a lot of information about it. And that's proven, too, because I, I have several of these running on my, on my bench in, in my uh, shop right now. The antenna's just laying on the tape on the bench around a lot of other stuff that's going on in my shop. It's, it's tracking just fine. TTL serial uh, NMEA output, 0183 output, uh, NMEA output, so of course that's compatible with about everything we're doing. Bot rate on this thing is really easy to set. Either ground two pins, ground one pin, you know, it's only just two pins to set your bot rate. Um, the uh, one pulse per second output is actually programmable. It's it's one, one second by default, but you can make the same do a lot of different speeds. That's important, and the reason I put that in there is because one of the things I really would like to see doing with this is uh, do time slotting. And if you're not familiar with time slotting, essentially what you can do is you can take a whole bunch of trackers, put them on a single channel, and you can time okay, uh, you can time slot them so that way, uh, you know, at the top of the minute, you know, this one transmits five seconds later, this one transmits, and by giving them the by giving them time slots, you can get a whole bunch of trackers into a single channel in a minute's time. It's really handy for things like you know a bike race or something where you're trying to track a whole bunch of assets. Uh, and of course, it's got a three volt uh, battery backup, so I gotta get going here. Uh, the uh, there's the circuit for the GPS. Uh, nothing real special. Uh, let's see, anything special I want to point out here. Uh, it does have a uh, a fix pin, which is nice. It goes high when it's got a fix. So if you just want a simple LED indication, the GPS has a fix. I don't even have to, uh, you know, have the ESP do that. I can just, and that's one of the LEDs that we're, that we're uh, using on the board to just give us a quick indication of this thing I can fix. Radio interface, we went with the mini DIN. We could have gone the, the uh, DB9 Cantronics, but the mini DIN is um, pretty much the standard now. It makes it sure, sure makes it easy. When you've got a radio that's already got a mini DIN port on it, you take a mini DIN and mini DIN cable, plug and play. 
Okay, so this is the current hardware. And if anyone wants to get a closer look at this, I got a couple of these stuff in the demo room if you want to come take a look at this. Uh, the only thing missing off this board right in a second is the mini DIN connector. But anyways, you can take a look. This this is the hardware we've got. You can see my fingers, and it kind of gives you an idea how big this how big this board is. There's a much better picture that I took in my my little light booth, so you can see it a little bit better. Um, we have made some uh, some some changes. Um, we revised the trim pot. That trim pot there, these are almost impossible to get now, of course. So we went to a slightly different one. Uh, we did have, uh, I added a voltage divider on the, uh, the uh, voltage coming in off the USB port so we can now report that voltage in the packet. Uh, we added uh, this analog uh, MCP9701 temp sensor. You might think, well, what's the point? That's kind of nice. If you have the thing in a hot car or whatever, you have it reporting at any given time, you can go look at it and say, oh, okay, it's, you know, it's 135,000 degrees inside my car right now. Uh, you know, it's kind of nice. And actually, I, I, that's an homage to Scott Miller, because Scott Miller was one of the first people I remember putting a temp sensor on the tracker board, on the open tracker, and I used to use that function all the time. Living in Virginia in the summer, <laughs> it's a little warm. Um, We've added uh, some LEDs. We've got power, which we already had. Transmit receive, which is bicolor LED, which I did point out. Real quick, I'll point out. This LED right here is actually a bicolor LED. It's red and green. There's your GPS and there's your power LED. Why did I put them here? Because it was convenient. Okay, and I was lazy. Um, but anyways, uh, we've added uh, LEDs for also Bluetooth status and Wi-Fi status. And uh, the mini DIN, we went to a more uh, uh, narrow profile connector. So here's what the hardware will look like. Uh, this is, I just revised this maybe about five days ago. Um, there's all your LEDs now. Everything's lined up nicely. Got your temp sensor here. And, uh, and then the, the pots are a little bit bigger. So that's, that's your improved hardware. That's essentially what it's going to be when, when it's all said and done. Configuration. Um, you got a couple options right now. There's a command line, kind of like a DOS. But then uh, Remy built in a really cool text editor right into the tracker. So if you're in it with Putty, you just go to the text editor and much, it looks much like, uh, almost like a batch file. And you just go in there and you know, TNC, the call sign, GP, you know, and there's a whole bunch more settings. This is just an example. So I just threw that in. Eventually we'd like to go to a web interface. This is just something I mocked up in HTML really quick just so I had something to show. It will, may or may not look something like this, but that's, that's the goal. I mentioned uh, Arduino IDE, it's a piece of junk, I'm just gonna say it. Uh, about two weeks ago, Remy said, hey, by the way, did I tell you I moved over to VS Code and platform I own? And I was like, uh, no, no, you didn't tell me that. I was like, uh, so I guess that's what we're gonna do. So that's what we're doing now. We're, we moved over to VS Code, platform I own, and um, I just threw up here, these are the three things that have to be installed to make this work, VS Code, Visual Studio Code, Python, and platform I own. And uh, I'm, as soon as I get back to Virginia, I'm going to set this all up and uh, so I, way I can start. Okay, we talked about tethering with smart devices. It's just some uh, quick screenshots from my phone. This is, uh, you can see I'm tethered to the SPTNC01. This was, uh, this was transmit attempts. Here's some receive packets that came in. Of course, just some stations and some mapping. So, and the cool thing about this is that I can do all this. And then when I'm done, I just turn off a press droid and uh, tracker goes right back into uh, Thomas tracking mode. So let's talk about cost real quick because I'm sure everyone's curious. ESP32, these are all current pricing I pulled yesterday, okay? ESP, $4.08. Remember, this is single quantity pricing, so you know if we get the quantity up, prices go down. Uh, the uh, GPS, 1680, the FTDI, okay, I was a little off. I think I said it was like $2.05, $2.35. Um, the temp sensor, $0.58, cents, mini DIN connector, $2.50. All other parts in that board are under 50 cents a piece, or most of them are under 10, like all your passives and everything. Those are all well under 10 cents. So about 40 bucks, you know, that's not bad. That's in single quantity. Um, you know, if, if you were to go out and buy all these parts and try to build one of these. So questions? Any questions? Sorry, I started kind of rushing through the end because I was running out of time. Yeah. Um, if you're building something new, Yeah. Okay, it is 
long, long, long past time to jump 1200 baud AFSK. Please, please do not build a new system that uses it. In Southern California. Well, California, I guess my whole point being here is pointless. I'll pack up. No, no, no. no. <laughs> the rest of your stuff is fine. Okay, it's just the RF motor. Okay. Well, okay. So let okay. me finish my okay. point. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In San Diego, we have been recovering National Weather Service radio signs by cell of Fort S on uh, RS 41s. Okay. They have 50 milliwatt transmitter. We can easily reprogram with firmware that's coming out of, of Europe and out of Australia, out of uh, Adelaide with 4 FSK at 100 baud with coding, the RF link margin is at least 20 dB better. 20 decibels. Can okay, you know how much 20 decibels? No, I, I, I get it. Yeah. All right. yeah, I get it. If you don't believe it, I will gladly send you I believe you. you. I believe you. I will gladly send you one. Okay? They weigh 85 grams with the batteries. They're essentially free. We pick them up off the desert. Well, somebody paid for it. Now, you could, you could implement the same thing or something very similar. Yeah. It would actually be much easier for you. Yeah. Much, much easier. This data rate is so low, you can take one of these Silicon Lab synthesizers and reprogram it through the I2C bus at 100 watt easily. That's, that's what we do. Okay. And as I said, you can get over 20 EV better rate margin. I mean, that is enormous. Please do not use a modem that was obsolete when it was chosen in the early 80s because Dell 202 modems were, were readily available. Okay. Well, I mean, I, and I and I get I get what you're saying, Phil. I I, I really do. The rest um, of your design is fine. Just yeah. just the motor. No, I, no, I get what, I get what you're saying. I I guess we look at the APRS network of what's currently out there. You know, what's it compatible? And no, I mean, what you're describing is not compatible with the current network. Right? We had exactly the same concern when the other guys. Once we discovered how much better this worked, we realized we didn't need the network. Yeah. Because we can hear it, we can hear it directly. Yeah. 20 dB. Okay. I don't care about the existing network okay. because I don't need it anymore. Okay. 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 Uh, one caveat I will say is, uh, you know, I mentioned that Remy is uh, into Laura, and uh, one thought was to maybe uh, integrate Laura into this. You know, we could, you know, make a Laura version of this. Um, you know, I mean, we haven't produced anything other than prototypes yet. You know, I got, I own every single prototype right now. I got, you know. So, anyways, um, I, I appreciate your input. You know, but. I, I will send you one. Okay, okay. Do we have any more questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on. Okay. I'll get back to you. Hold on. Oh, you started out your presentation with a, a nice touch screen display, but if you've got Bluetooth links into phones, do you even need that? Well, okay, so that, that's a very good point. And that's kind of, that, I guess, I, you know, I kind of left that out, and, and that's a very good point that having that ability with the phone or a tablet or whatever does kind of eliminate that. There are some people that do like that tactile, or not, that's the wrong word actually. They like having that all-in-one device that they can just put in their vehicle, like you know, a D710 G or whatever. So I guess in a way we thought, oh, maybe it would be nice to eventually have that all-in-one device you just plug power and a radio into, you know, and then you wouldn't have that. But yes, you bring up a very good point, and that's one of the reasons I, I love the whole idea about being able to connect a smart device. So. Yeah. Have you given any thought to support for any other sensors besides temperature, things like barometric pressure and particulate? Yeah. yeah, so um, actually, I just, uh, um, the boards are going to be literally sitting on my doorstep when I get home. I got a test board I just laid out for a BME 280. It's a Bosch sensor that does temperature, temperature, pressure, and humidity. And it's a uh, I, uh, I squared C or SPI, I forget now. Um, there's, we were talking about maybe trying to do a version of this that would have more sensor input, maybe some GPIO that's brought out for being able to do a weather station, something like that. Cause my wife's a meteorologist for NOAA, so we're, it's definitely an interest that she has, which kind of falls on me as an interest as well. So I definitely would like to do something like that. So, yeah. yeah and I'm afraid we're out of time. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I appreciate it.